Hello, everybody. We'll just wait a cup, just another minute as people are still trickling in. Okay, I think we're good. Um, so let's get started. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to uh, the second lecture. Um, that I'm giving in, in the sequence, uh, and we'll be mainly talking about technology and education today, but I'll probably spend the first 10 or 15 minutes covering the last topic from school governance, which is a larger topic given the number of different things there are under that. Um, so, and, and I realized yesterday that I do talk quite fast. I, I, we managed to cover most of the material, but the good news is for stuff you didn't catch, uh, the recordings will be up on YouTube and you can play that back at 0.75 speed if you need to. Uh, and my students often do that. So uh, with, that, with that said, let's get underway. Uh, we have a lot to cover. Okay. Um, so the topics we covered, so again, if you just remember the big picture, and I'll keep coming back to a little bit of this framing in a cross-country sense, okay, which is that what you see is that higher income countries and in fact, higher income states within India, where I do most of my work, um, there's a, always a strong positive correlation between GDP per capita and different measures of education attainment and, and learning outcomes. Okay, so, uh, and, and the big picture goal here for us is to see, can you improve the efficiency and effectiveness of public expenditure that allows you to deliver a lot more outcomes at any given level of GDP per capita. Okay, and we spend a lot of our time talking really about governance and, and teacher incentives and motivation, partly because teacher salaries are the biggest line item of expenditure. And, you know, the, the punchline really is that the way we typically spend most of our money in terms of unconditional increases in teacher salaries, for the most part, seem to have very little uh, impact on learning outcomes, uh, whereas very modest amounts of performance-based pay that are often three to five percent of total pay, um, but that give you a performance-based spread, end up having substantially larger impacts, okay? So now, this is not to say that doing performance-based pay is easy, because it does take a careful amount, a substantial amount of attention to details of measurement, of design, of data integrity, but the point is to say that if a hundred percent percent pay increase doesn't get you anything and a three to five percent increase in performance pay does get you such big impacts then it's probably worthwhile spending another couple of percent of the education budget thinking hard about how do you do this kind of measurement okay so I'll tie the loop back with this measurement and data integrity at the end of today's lecture on technology um, but that really was kind of the main message. And then we've got this result on contract teachers, which again, um, it is really quite striking, right? That you see multiple studies uh, just document that you can have locally hired teachers who are much, uh, you know, much less qualified and paid much lower salaries who are as effective, if not more effective when it comes to primary education. Okay, again, we're talking about basic foundational literacy and numeracy. Um, at a, and if you go to higher grades, then obviously the teacher knowledge is going to become more of a constraint. But given where the world is, and this is a course in education in developing countries, and I'll, you'll see a little bit more about this, and I'll come back to talking about what the priorities should be. Um, it really is that you've got, say, in India, 50% of kids completing primary school who are not basically functionally literate and numerate. Okay, so as an education system, to me, that really is the most important priority. And we've taken now 15 years, we've known this, and we still, still seem to not have made meaningful progress on that, which really is quite uh, depressing and disturbing. And so, you know, it's just time to act on all of this stuff. Okay, um, so let's now talk about the last piece in, in governance, which is school management. And, and what we mean by management is really, you know, uh, again, in a production function sense, you've got your inputs and you've got your TFP, which is the productivity of those inputs. And you can think about management as a really important component of that TFP. Um, and now the challenge is how do you measure this? And so uh, we've got this uh, recent paper uh, with Renata Lemos and Daniela Skour, who worked closely over the years with Nick Bloom and John Van Rienen as part of their cross-country research agenda on measuring management practices. Okay, so um, this is called the WMS, which is the World Management Survey. And the World Management Survey was mainly kind of designed in the context of manufacturing and other industries and implemented mostly in higher income settings to begin with. Um, 
But over time, it's expanded to cover more sectors as well as more countries. Now, one of the problems when you take the WMS to low income settings is that WMS has a scale of one to five. OK, and most of the developing countries would score somewhere between one and two. And the way that WMS works is you have integer coding, which means anything below a two would be rounded down to a one. So you're not a, if you're, you're not quite a two and then you go down to one. OK, so what will happen when you use the WMS in low income settings is you will get a massive massive amount of bunching in the distribution that happens on the left hand side. And so what we ended up needing to do is to develop and use a much more granular tool, which is the development world management survey uh, that just takes uh, the measurement in more and breaks it down to be more granular. And so the reason that matters is then you get a substantial amount of spread between one and two on the score, which otherwise you wouldn't have. OK, now. The other nice thing about the DWMS is it's designed to be completely comparable to the WMS. Okay, so you can put those two on a common scale and you can actually compare them. Um, and so that allows us to put together. So what we did was implemented the DWMS in India in the sample where I had done my uh, the school choice study, which Jishnu and Asim will talk about next week. But basically, we administered that in a representative sample of rural public and primary schools in the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh. And what you see here is in this global scale, you've got high income countries, right, OECD countries uh, in blue, um, and you've got low and middle income countries in red, and you see how low this management score here is, okay, so um, in government schools, which is AP public, you're about one standard deviation below this uh, mm, the sample mean, right? And then the high income country mean is, is close to one standard deviation, okay? Now you look at this and you say, wait, uh, you know, again, uh, this, is, this is low, but how does this look like uh, once you adjust for income? And so exactly in the vein I showed you yesterday, once I, I, and I really think when people talk about outcomes of any kind, it is important to adjust for income just so that we get a sense of, are we doing what is expected based on where we are in the development trajectory, okay? And it turns out that in fact, um, though the management scores are so much lower in, in the public schools in AP, that once you put this in a, you know, in a, in a cross-country perspective, um, it's actually not an outlier, okay? It's not an outlier after adjusting for income. Um, and But what it does suggest is that variation in TFP in education systems may also partly explain this income outcome gradient. So remember, we've got this gradient we talked about between GDP per capita and education outcomes. And one part of that is going to be variation in inputs. It's going to be include variation in parental education. Um, but what this is suggesting is that there's also likely to be variation in management quality, okay? So which is also systematically weaker in lower income countries. So, and so therefore improving the quality of school management may be an important component of improving developing country education systems. Okay, so again, I'm just using these figures as a way of motivating um, what we're about to show you in terms of interventions itself. Mm. And then that paper is, again, it's a descriptive paper. Um, but one thing that's really striking is um, you can break down the management scores into people management and operations management. And where you see the big difference is in personnel management, OK? So um, you've got these people management scores. And this is already very, very low, right? So one is the absolute lowest in a five-point scale. So you'll see this is why if you didn't have the DWMS to give you granularity, everybody would just be lumped at one, right? Because most of this variation is sitting between one and two, um, whereas the OECD means would be sitting more like in the two to, uh, in so closer to three, okay? And the variation will be in the two, uh, three to five range, okay? Um, so but the main point of this is that uh, echoing some of the results we talked about yesterday, right, which is uh, that there's, uh, there's weak accountability, um, you see that public schools do especially poor on personnel management, okay, and that's consistent with differences in absence and the rates of active teaching that we observe in the data. And it's also consistent with basically, if you look at the private school labor markets, that in the private schools, even though the level of teacher pay is much, much lower than the public sector, you do find a strong correlation between between teacher value added and pay in private schools, and there's no such correlation in the public schools. Okay, so essentially, because remember the value add for the teacher, we're calculating after taking out all your observables. Okay, so it's it's not just what's on your CV, it's not your education, it's not your training, it's your actual effectiveness in teaching. Okay, and so what the data suggests is that you know the private schools and private school management are able to identify effective teachers even beyond what's on the CV and make sure that they're paid better. Okay. Whereas in the public schools, there's absolutely no gradient uh, a correlation between pay and productivity. If anything, the point estimate is negative, again, suggesting that older teachers are systematically 
paid more, um, but they also in the data tend to be more powerful and therefore the ones who are more absent who can get away with more. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so this is just kind of connecting the dots back with yesterday on some of the stuff we saw in personnel. Um, and you know the main point of this paper is also just uh, it's value added, but it's also just to show that these management scores are correlated with independently collected data on teaching activity as well as value added. Okay, so it suggests broadly that management matters. Okay, but it's one thing to know that management matters. Um, and again, like, you know, in the education literature, uh, this was important because the previous papers just had levels of test scores as opposed to value add. And we know that value add is a meaningfully better measure of school effectiveness, okay? Because it at least controls for the incoming variation in student learning levels, okay? Uh, so where do we go from here? So the real question now is, if we think that management matters, can we do something um, to improve management at scale? Okay, so we've seen public education systems have weak management. So what can we do to improve this? So there have been a bunch of other papers looking at uh, variations of school-based management interventions. Um, and for the most part, those results have been quite disappointing, um, in a way consistent with some of the evidence on participatory governance, which is there's, there's collective action problems as well as power asymmetry problems. Okay, so there are some pockets of positive evidence, but for the most part, there isn't that much positive um, evidence in school-based management, at least in developing country settings. Okay, so what we're doing now in this other paper, which I'm going to talk about, mm -hmm is looking at a large scale uh, school management program that was implemented across most of India. Um, and so, because it's not that governments don't understand that management is important. So low and middle income countries, increasingly understand the importance of school management. They want to improve it. Um, and there's many, many such reforms. There's about 160 examples in 84 countries in just the World Bank database um, that we documented. Uh, but there's very little evidence of impact, okay? So uh, governments are doing a lot of stuff. Donors are funding a lot of stuff, um, but we don't really know if it's working, okay? So what we're doing in this paper with, joined with Abhijit Singh at Stockholm School of Economics is that it's a large scale RCT of a school management intervention in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh, um, which is again about a little over 70 million people. Um, and so the program, which is called the MP School Quality Assessment Program, it was modeled after several global best practices in school management. And in a way, it, it's an exemplar of a donor funded aid project, okay, which is uh, uh, the government of MP um, was very keen on improving school management. Um, they approached what was then DFID, now FCDO, uh, you know, and I've presented this to FCDO, okay, so full credit to them, like, you know, they're happy to get bad news. Uh, but, but basically, like, you know, it was, a, so what, what, the, what DFID did was they reached out to a bunch of experts and got uh, um, this company called ARC that had, uh, was running a bunch of charter schools in the US and the UK, and also doing work on school, um, school governance. So this intervention really did reflect a bunch of global best practices, okay, it had inputs from Ofsted. And so the, the theory of change here, was that they were going to have comprehensive school quality assessments. So you're going to have an external inspector come and spend a couple of days assessing every aspect of the school, okay, and giving the school a very detailed summary report of where are you, how are you doing, okay. Mm -hmm. And then once you had that, the next step was supposed to have, um, so there was supposed to be customized school improvement plans, okay, that every school was supposed to have based on this assessment, a sense of, okay, this is where we are, this is where we need to go, okay, so what are we going to do and how are we going to get there. And then there was an intended regular follow up by cluster resource coordinators. Mm -hmm. But there was no incentives, okay, explicit or implicit. And then there was there was a piece of community engagement as well. Um, but there was no incentive. So so what is the logic of this? The logic of this design mm, is that if there's if you look at management theory. Um, a lot of management theory says that why do poorly performing organizations exist? So there's this nice paper by Gibbons and Henderson that reviews uh, these theories. And one of the, 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 the key ideas there is low performing organizations can exist for a range of reasons. Okay, so one is you don't know you're bad, so you don't even think you need to improve. The second is you may know you're bad, but you don't know what to do about it. The third is you may know you're bad, you may know that you need to do certain things, but you have no motivation or incentive to do that. And the last is even if you have all of these three things, you need to get other people acting with you over whom you don't have kind of direct say and control. Okay, so the, the theory here was designed to do each of these things. Okay, so the assessment and the school report cards are supposed to tell you how you're doing. The customized school improvement plans are supposed to then give you actionable steps of how do you get better. Um, the regular follow ups by 
the cluster resource coordinators are meant to provide some motivation and follow up to make sure you're doing it. And the engagement of the community and the CRC were meant to make sure that if other people needed to do things for you to improve, that that was also going to happen. Okay, but at the same time, there was, and this is particularly true when you think about the public sector, right, which is, um, there was also a belief that doing any kind of formal incentives in the public sector is difficult, it's not, you know, mm, we should be focusing more on intrinsic motivation and getting uh, teachers and school leaders to want to improve and give them the tools they need to improve. Okay, um, so there's a lot to be said for that, but basically the design here had, had no incentives, okay. Mm -hmm. So this was a fl the flagship program of the government of MP, and they were going to stagger, scale, scale this up in a staggered way, um, where they first did a proof of concept pilot in about 100 schools for a couple of mm, about 18 months. Then there was going to be the, uh, the first phase, which was about 2,000 schools, um, and then the second phase of 25,000, and then they were going to scale up to close to 100,000 schools. Okay, So what we did was we got in at that second stage after the proof of concept of 100 schools, but when they were going up to about 2,000, so we focus on elementary schools. So that's the 1,774. Um, there's another close to 200 that were high schools. Okay. Um, so basically, this was a large scale RCT randomized across uh, five districts with a population representative of about 10 million people. Uh, we collected an enormous amount of data. And so what happens? Okay. So what happens is it was really quite illuminating. Okay. So uh, the, fir the first thing that we see is that the assessments were completed, okay? They were, they were completed and they were high quality assessments. Um, so 93% of the schools that were assigned to the treatment group had done the assessment and they had the school improvement plan prepared, okay? Um, and there was also meaningful variation across the schools. So it's not like there was collusion in the reports, okay? Um, and most of the schools in fact were rated in teaching and learning as being below standards, which we know in fact is true um, from other field data, okay? so. Um, there's every reason to believe that these assessments were of high quality and that the school improvement plans were prepared and they were uploaded. Okay, uh, but that's where the good news stops. Okay, the, uh, the, the good news stops there because after that, when we go look at our ongoing monitoring surveys, we find that there was no change in frequency of visits or the content of inspections. So there's no change in or support or oversight. And the school management committees also did not play a more active role, okay, in the treatment schools. Mm -hmm. And um, consistent with all of that, we find now you, you might say that, OK, even if you didn't have that, teachers got more motivated looking at the data, looking at the report cards, looking at um, you know, the school improvement plan, but basically nothing changed, okay? Nothing changed. Teacher absence was high and remained unchanged. Uh, there was no impact on instructional time, use of textbooks or workbooks, uh, likelihood of checking homework, and student absence rates were also high and, and unaffected, okay? Mm. And unsurprisingly, given that there's no change in any activity, we also see no change in test scores, okay? Both in administrative assessments as well as our own tests, okay? Um, and so, you know, it, it's very disappointing. And sometimes, you know, we have to go back to our grant proposal to see how optimistic we were about this, this entire intervention, okay? Because it looked so well thought out on paper and it had, you know, support of the top political and bureaucratic leadership. It had global inputs and expertise. It, everything looked sensible, okay? But absolutely nothing happened. Now, but the story gets even more surreal from this, okay? This is not just a case of an intervention that didn't work, okay? The reason the story gets surreal is the intervention still got scaled up, okay? Um, because the government had planned for this expansion to the next phase of 25,000 schools. And by then, this program had gotten picked up as kind of an all India exemplar of a high quality school management and governance program. And so there was a national program called Shala Siddhi uh, that basically had the same idea. And if anything, it was slightly weaker, right? Because um, you, when you scale up across the country, you didn't have the resources for external assessment. So mm, that initial assessment was replaced by school self-assessment. Um, and But the rest was pretty much the same, okay? And then the plans were made much more detailed. You had to get even more granular in <clears> your <throat> school improvement plans. And at the time of writing the paper, it had already been scaled up to over 600,000 schools. Mm -hmm and targeting eventually 1.6 million schools, okay? Um, and when we presented the results of the non-impact, I think basically the senior officials of the government said, listen, you know, we're already on track to do the scale up, but you know, things will get better. So why don't you also evaluate the next phase as we scale up, okay? Now, so that was not possible to randomize across 25,000 schools, but mm, we kind of did a match pair design where we identified a set of controls before we went and collected data. And we uh, it was a set of schools that satisfied parallel trends in previous years, again, before we collected the data. Um, and again, we find basically absolutely no impact, okay? So mm -hmm, 
And, and, and that's not surprising to us, okay? So I think but the deeper question, the reason I'm going into all of this is that we spend a lot of time talking about research and, and studies, okay? But this seems to be like one of these completely surreal cases where what's going on in government seems to be oblivious, okay, um, to what the evidence is saying. And so we then spent a lot of time doing qualitative work, figuring out just what on earth is going on, okay? Which is why was this program kind of, why did it look so good on paper? Why did it fail in practice? And why did it get scaled up, even though, right, I mean, it was, it was failing, okay? Um, and in many ways, I think the most insightful parts to me of this project were the qualitative work we did, okay? Um, and so what we did was, you know, so we, that extensive, mm, so I tend to get a little suspicious of qualitative work and a lot of economists do because, you know, if you, given how much variation there is, you can tell whatever story you want based on where in the distribution you sample, okay? So we, dis, we disciplined the sampling with a Obviously, we couldn't do qualitative interviews for like the hundreds of schools, right? But we 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 stratified and randomized our sample for qualitative interviews, okay? And basically, what we find is that on the ground, essentially, this entire program was reduced to an exercise in administrative compliance, okay? So essentially, both teachers and supervisors, for them, they perceived this program primarily as a data collection and paperwork effort, okay? So because what was being monitored was the paperwork. Uh, so which meant that the school assessments had to be done and those reports had to be uploaded onto a portal, okay? The school improvement plans had to be created and had to be submitted, okay? So that was the thing that everybody put their effort on because that was what was being monitored, okay? Um, so the paperwork was submitted in time because this principal secretary would have a dashboard in front of her um, just saying, you know, how many assessments have been done, how many reports have been, uh, improvement plans have been uploaded. But effectively, the program delivery essentially stopped after those school improvement plans were filed okay so once that was filed there was no change in follow-up there was no change in anything it's just that from an administrative perspective what mattered was that the paperwork was done okay and so and that relates then to the second part of the question which is why was this perceived to be successful okay so one was what how did the program function on the ground how did teachers and administrators kind of react to this. Um, but the flip side is, why was the program perceived to be successful, okay? Um, and what we realize is that this, these features really relate much more broadly to bureaucratic incentives in the public sector that mainly reward the appearance of activity, okay, rather than improving outcomes which are not measured, okay. So, uh, and this is true in any bureaucracy, right, not just the public sector, it's true to some extent even in the private sector, and it's definitely true in universities, okay, where uh, when there's a problem, it's important that you're appearing to be doing something, okay, rather than, but nobody's actually measuring the impact, okay. So, things are evaluated on intention and effort as opposed to outcomes. And this is just all pervasive <clears throat> in, in bureaucracies around the world, okay? So, and so what this meant was everybody thought the program was a success because on, on, on all the observable metrics, everything looked great, okay? Um, and then, you know, we've got a whole bunch of qualitative sites and stuff in the paper, but I just thought, you know, yeah. So, so the contributions, I'll do this quickly. How am I on time? Yeah, I better. Mm, wanted to finish in 20 minutes, I'm at 25, okay? So I'm gonna skip through the contributions. I think the main point is that there's a large literature now on management and both in terms of the levels and trying to improve it. Mm. So there's high quality work on, you know, RCTs based on management consulting interventions in private firms. And you see that that improved productivity in India, in Mexico. So these are well-published papers. There's kind of long-term follow-ups that finds that there's positive effect. Um, but basically we see that trying to do this in the public sector, right? We had no impact, okay? So, and so essentially what we conjecture is that the important, there's a, a really key reason here is the lack of incentives, okay? So, um, there is growing evidence of complementarities across inputs that includes knowledge, okay, and incentives in education. So we saw that paper uh, in Tanzania. Um, we've got similar evidence in health, um, and even in the private sector, this famous paper on soccer balls and what it takes to adopt a new technology that even when the technology is more productive, if the workers weren't paid based, you know, compensated for the fact that their productivity would initially fall in using a new technology, that you didn't get the deployment, okay? So essentially, a lot of the development programming and aid thinking and policy thinking tends to be on the supply side. Let's push inputs, let's push knowledge, let's push training. But if you don't do much work on the incentive side, right, I mean, things perhaps don't move as much, okay? Um, 
And so, and it's worth contrasting this with results in the US and the UK where school ratings have had an impact, but these were settings like No Child Left Behind where, and in the UK Ofsted inspections, you know, that there is a threat of sanctions for low performing schools and principals, okay? Whereas in this setting, uh, there's no incentive either positive or negative, okay? So that's likely one important piece of why this thing didn't work, okay? Uh, but more generally, I think it just highlights how difficult it is to change large organizations, especially in the public sector. Okay, so um, sometimes you look at zeros and saying, oh, but there's so many reasons it couldn't have worked. That's true. But the point is that this kind of intervention is being done by so many countries around the world that it's really important to learn. <laughs> Okay, that this did not work. Um, and it illustrates the nature of bureaucratic incentives. And there's an old sociology literature. Um, and one of the most uh, highly cited papers in sociology was this paper uh, talking about institutional isomorphism. Okay, and I'll give you a couple of quotes on that, which basically says that organizations copy each other to build legitimacy, even if it doesn't have impact. Okay, and, and it just highlights the importance of independence evaluations of development projects and programs. So. Here's then a quote from an anthropologist who's written like an entire book on kind of the functioning of the Indian state. And, and this is not even in the context of education, but there's this great quote that says, what stands out here are higher level officials in the administrative hierarchy, making decisions about programs and targets that bear little relevance to realities in the ground. Also present in turn are subordinates faithfully executing programs on paper, but caring little for how well they are implemented. Okay, so targets are indeed met, but the ultimate goals of the program go unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so we think that this is, um, you know, and though it's said in the context of education, we think what we're finding here probably applies to every part of the government and kind of highlights then the importance of studying bureaucracies more, which is separate from education, but it is kind of where a lot of my own research interests are going these days in terms of state capacity, because what we're seeing is there's all of the evidence that we find from smaller scale studies that are well done, but then when you want to take that insight and start putting it into government and getting things done at scale, the set of issues you're dealing with are completely different, okay? Uh, so then there's uh, this question about why do governments continue doing these things? And this is a set of quotes from this classic paper by DeMarge and Powell. So they talk about this idea of institutional isomorphism. And some of the key ideas there are that organizations tend to model themselves after similar organizations in their field <clears throat> that they perceive to be more legitimate or successful. These institutional isomorphic processes can be expected to proceed even in the absence of evidence, okay, <clears throat> that they increase organizational efficiency. And such mimicry has a ritual aspect that organizations adopt these innovations to enhance their legitimacy to demonstrate that they're at least trying to improve. Okay, and to us, just looking at these quotes, it kind of perfectly encapsulates what's happened in this entire project, which is why were the senior officials so excited about the project, right? Because they were seeing this as modeling global best practices, which they were very keen to bring into the Indian setting. Um, and then why was this scaled up? It was scaled up because essentially the process was generating utility to the system, okay, from the perspective of appearing to kind of take this problem seriously. And, 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 and no, I'm not even saying that there was anything cynical here, right? I think people were very sincere. Everybody really thought that the program was going to have an effect, okay? Um, people, you know, senior officials, I think we estimate in the paper that the total time spent on this was about 35,000 teacher years of time. Once you account for how much time went into the assessments, the reports, the school improvement programs. So this was a flagship high priority program and people were very sincere about it. It's just that you typically don't have the evaluations coming and showing you that this emperor had no clothes. Okay. Mm. So, so the conclusions from all of this is that the returns to improving management quality may be especially high in the public sector. Okay. Given that it's low to begin with, but it's also going to be much harder. Mm. We cannot identify what factors would lead to success, okay? So as with any failure, um, it could have failed for many sets of reasons. But, you know, the three important factors that we highlight based on studies of other studies, that interventions that seem to have worked, the first is incentives. The second is this visibility and outcomes, okay? And I'll come back to this at the very end of this lecture. Essentially, when I look at some of the other programs I've studied that have had big positive impacts, um, including, say, you know, use the biometric smart cards to make payments in rural welfare programs, you know, one of the big differences from having been in those meetings, seeing how the secretary would take the review meetings with the district staff would be that he would have data every month on the payments that had been received at the level of the end user, okay? And so what was interesting was that the culture of those review meetings would start with the data at the level at which it was visible, okay? So, which meant that even without formal incentives, the basic institutions, so again, this is not like people are slacking, right? Senior officials in the Indian bureaucracy are working incredibly hard, okay? But basically, when they take review meetings with the junior staff, they can only do this with the data they have, okay? So, 
And so one conjecture here is that that other program probably worked much better because there was visibility down to the last beneficiary. And so you could monitor the progress on the payments being made to the last citizen. Whereas here you had visibility up to the level of the school of filing the improvement plan, but you had no visibility on student learning and no visibility on classroom processes. Okay. So essentially the effectiveness of the program continues down to the level where things are visible, but then stop at that point. Mm. And again, there's a reason I'm spending so much time on this, because when I talk about technology, I'm going to talk not about technology in an abstract sense. I'm going to talk about technology as a way of kind of alleviating some of these binding constraints that we seem to be seeing from other work. Um, and the last one is just staffing, OK? Mm -hmm which is what you see in these bureaucracies is you keep on adding more and more and more burdens and expectations, but without adding staffing, okay? So at some point, um, what you see is that people are already overburdened administratively and just didn't have the time to go do the additional follow-ups. So, and that's important because talking to the management experts like Dave McKinsey, who've done a bunch of these RCTs, what they'll tell you is that even in the private sector, for management interventions to work, you need them to be really intense with a fair bit of follow up, because the whole point of management training or anything that's practical is not about the theory, it's about getting the coaching and the support to do this thing on an ongoing basis. Okay, so maybe this sort of work with more staffing, but you know, this is a level of staffing that's just not feasible at scale. And so what you saw is perhaps the best of what you may be able to see at scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then more generally for the broader kind of international development and aid industry, so to speak, right? Governments and donors are constantly designing and deploying programs to improve service delivery and developing outcomes. Mm. But the programs are often judged on the design quality, best practices, and the number of people reached. So even now, if you go look at the websites of many prominent kind of, you know, nonprofits that are funded by donors, you know, the metrics are going to be how many people they reached, okay? And by those metrics, this program was a resounding success because it reflected every best practice or in, you know, many, many best practices, and it reached kind of millions of people, right? Um, but that's again why you need these independent evaluations, um, you know, and this was the same with the double for nothing paper right so enough people in the system thought that increasing salaries unconditionally would lead to a big improvement in outcomes okay um, and. And we found nothing. Okay, so there is another way to interpret a lot of these results. Okay, which is to say that when interventions are done at a smaller scale, uh, they seem to be successful. But anything that's done at scale with government ends up not working. Okay, and there that's a reasonable view. Okay, which is and that's why I'm saying that in a way it's not that the small scale studies don't matter because when you do some eight things in small scale and six of them don't work and two of them do, at least it tells you that you shouldn't even bother scaling the other six because. Mm -hmm, they didn't even work at a smaller scale, but that you need to then think very hard about what additional systems you need to put in place for the two successful interventions to be able to scale. Okay, so let me stop there on, on governance and switch to technology, but take like a two minute break for questions. We have a question about the field work. So yep. Rashmi says, during my field work in India, I observed at some of my selected institutes, there was a huge difference between the paperwork and the reality. How do you deal with such issues? No, exactly, right? I mean, I think, this issue is well known to people doing qualitative research, right? And so I think, and that's why there's complementarity between the qualitative and the quantitative, right? Because the problem is if you were to do the qualitative, just the qualitative work, okay, and go mm, tell the senior secretaries that look on, on the ground, you know, this looks like this is mainly paperwork and nothing is working. And what the secretary will very sincerely tell you is, um, you know, but when you do, maybe this was just a few schools you went to, when you do this at scale, we do expect that there will be some positive effects. Okay. And that's exactly what they were telling us, which is to say, you know, changing systems is hard, we will do this, we will push, it will change culture, it will change practice, over time it will change outcomes, okay? So, and that's why we did the two-year RCT and we did the four two-year follow-up, right? So over four years, we now had data to say, listen, nothing really changed. And because you've got the systematic RCT evidence, now you know for sure that it was basically nothing changed. And then the qualitative work gives you the insights into why, okay? So this is a good example of the complementarity of the qualitative and quantitative work. Now, what do you do about it? is a really, really hard problem, okay? And so, and when I come back and talk about technology, one way really is to start using technology a lot more for frontline work data collection. And that has the advantage of both kind of increasing the speed and the reliability and the speed and the reliability and kind of, um, you know, the use uh, hopefully uh, for the purpose they were meant to, okay? So I'll come back to that at the very end. Uh, we have another question about the data from Swasti who asks, uh, how did the researchers in the mentioned papers interview the government officials, given the senior officials may not directly say the programs only worked on paper? 
No, so uh, these interviews are not coming from talking at the secretary level, right? You know, they're coming from interviews at the school and the block level. So these are down at the district level, right? So, um, so they at, at least at the school, they were completely, the teachers, uh, there's a whole bunch of quotes we have, right? Uh, the teachers were perfectly happy just saying the main result of this program is paperwork. I spent all of this time filling all these forms and all of these reports. And once I filed them, nothing happened, right? So um, yeah, so these interviews happen at a lower level of government where people are often very, very candid. So there was no problem there. Okay, so I'm going to move on um, to technology, and this was supposed to be the topic, but you will see how I connect it back, okay? So, so one thing um, to realize about education more broadly, right? So Isaac talked about the education production function, right? And the production function has a bunch of inputs, and it has productivity, okay? It has this TFP parameter. But if you look at productivity gains across sectors um, around the world, you'll see that education is actually one of the sectors with the lowest in increase in productivity, okay? So one way to see that is if you look at inflation, uh, because Inflation, the CPI, is being calculated with a basket of goods, right? That reflects everything that people buy, okay? Um, and relative to the CPI, the cost of education has gone up much, much more, okay? And that's a classic example of what's called Baumol's disease, right? So basically, Baumol's disease says that sectors of the economy that are labor intensive and do not kind of have the same, uh, or, or, or service sector, right? That do not have the same uh, extent of productivity increases from technology will end up seeing increased costs relative to the rest of the economy. And that's because the wages end up keeping pace across industries because people will move, which means in some industries, wages are growing even though productivity is growing in other sectors and not in that sector, okay? so. In fact, let me just show you this one picture and come back. Okay, so this is, I picked this up uh, from the Wikipedia page on Baumol's cost disease, uh, but it really is quite striking. Okay, so this is data from the US um, and you look at the overall kind of rate of price inflation in this uh, 35 year period. And you see, for example, that in these 35 years, clothing and apparel, right? I mean, the prices have only gone up by about 50%. Mm vehicles, commodities, transportation, food, all items, okay? So that black line there is the CPI. And so this itself is going to be a weighted average of the different items in your consumption basket, okay? So these guys below this have kind of, the prices have grown less than the average, um, but then look at where the costs are higher, right? So it's 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 health, right? Uh, and, and like in a league of its own is education, okay? Mm. And so, for example, even though health costs have also gone up, the difference on the health side is there's also been a lot more health innovation, new products, new technologies. So if you try to unbundle the increase in healthcare spending, it, en it ends up being that more of the healthcare spending is because you're buying more stuff. OK, so that's even more of a quantity story you're reflecting more innovation um, and rather than a cost story. OK, uh, but whereas in education, there is there's, there's been very little change in productivity. Right. It's not like we have new life saving drugs drugs or new life-saving procedures, right? For the most part, we're doing exactly what we did before, okay? And so that's kind of why uh, college tuition and fees are out there in a league of their own, okay, in terms of prices. And this is clearly something that people have been noticing and, you know, thinking hard about what to do about this, okay? So, so that's the context for kind of motivating um, the excitement about technology, okay? So um, there's just a lot of excitement about technology and education because the reason you have that curve is that the technology of instruction has basically been unchanged in the last hundred plus years, okay? So it's chalk and talk. You have a teacher in front of a blackboard using a chalk and talking, and that is one teacher, 20 kids, 30 kids, whatever. Like, you know, there has been nothing that's fundamentally making that enterprise more productive, okay? Which is reflected in the cost data that I just showed you. Okay? Okay, so, and that's why there's lots of excitement about technology and education and why people in Silicon Valley, right, talk about disrupting education, right, as an industry. Now, there's a lot of good reasons for this, okay, which is, if you, if you think about all the ways in which technology can improve uh, teaching and learning, um, it really does seem quite, you know, like, mm, transformative in terms of its potential, okay, so, mm, you get cost effective access to high quality instruction. Um, I can take a few high quality professors and make that content available globally, right? I mean, what we're seeing here with this bread class, right? So, you know, you got, you, you, you picked Mark from Yale, you picked Esther from MIT, you picked me from, you, you, from UCSD, you've got Isaac from Virginia, you know, you've got Asim at Harvard, right? I mean, this is exactly this channel playing out in real time, okay? That uh, you get uh, people, mm, who you know? Who you think are, uh, are are leading a particular field, and then you put together a course of, of content and make that available to everybody. Okay. Uh 
It similarly allows you to leapfrog constraints in teacher knowledge. Okay, so often you'll have teachers. Um, let's just take the example of teaching English language in low income countries where there's huge demand, but teachers often don't know English themselves. Okay, so um, there's these very sad YouTube videos about kind of, you know, teachers teaching English very poorly in India, but it's really incredibly unfair to the teacher, right? Because they have grown up not speaking English and they're suddenly expected to teach it. And so again, this is a case where the technology could leapfrog the constraints in teacher knowledge. Mm. You could supplement instruction, um, you could do practice, you could reinforcement at home, um, you can customize the learning paths for students um, and, you know, because different students are at different levels, are learning at different rates, uh, you can induce greater engagement. Mm. And you can shorten the feedback loop, okay, from, um, so today, if somebody turns in an assignment, the teacher, even if you're very sincere, will take a few days to grade this and give you back a grade. And by the time you get that, you've almost forgotten why you made the mistake in the first place, okay? But now, um, the computer can instantly grade my work and tell me, okay, what I got wrong, or I can keep working and seeing, right, I mean, how, uh, what mistakes I'm making. Um, and then one of the things we've seen in the pandemic, right, is that uh, technology and mobile phones in particular also enable better engagement with parents, um, which could be an important part of the production function. Um, and, you know, people like Peter Bergman had started working on this even earlier um, in the US. Okay, so there are huge reasons to be excited. And you can also use technology to improve governance, okay? And that includes uh, monitoring teacher attendance. So we saw that with Esther and Rima's cameras paper, right? That whole um, project was possible because the technology um, it made the attendance not just observable, but verifiable, okay? So, um, and the basic difference in contract theory is, you know, I can be a school inspector who shows up to a school and finds the teacher is not there, okay? But if I need to prove that in a court of law, then when I take that case up, it's my word against the teacher's word. And the teacher might say, hey, I had just stepped out for half an hour, okay? So, which means that even when I observe something, the cost of verifying that to a third party is very, very high, which makes it difficult to kind of enforce contracts, okay? But now if I have the technology with a time date stamp, right? I mean, then I, I, it's much easier to verify as opposed to just observe, okay? And so that should improve outcomes. Mm. And I'll talk about this at the end of the class today about, you know, improving outcome measurement, okay? Um, so, so there's huge potential. The bad news is when you go look at the data, right? And this is, again, why we need the evidence to discipline the hype, okay? Um, and you'll see that the evidence is basically all over the place uh, and not lived up to the hype. So, there was kind of, um, so Esther and Abhijit did this early study on remedying education, where in addition to the Bal Sakhi, which is this kind of supplemental tutor, um, they'd also done a computer-aided learning program, and they found that that was highly effective, okay? Um, in math, they got close to 0.5 standard deviations of, of improvement after two years. These are huge effects, but given that the study was done in the early 2000s and the technology was more expensive, um, they found that that was about five to seven times less cost effective than using the Balsakis, okay? So remember, the Balsakis are very similar to the demographic of the contract teachers I talked about yesterday, right? And they're much less expensive. Um, and so from a scale-up perspective, Pratham ended up spending much more of its time focusing on the Balsakis rather than computer-aided learning per se, though that particular study did find positive effects and Pratham's now come back to digital learning in a big way um, as the costs have fallen and as the pandemic has made it more important to kind of reach um, households and communities, okay? So that's positive effects. Then you have, uh, and again, there's many, many more papers in all of this, so this is just meant to be illustrative, okay? Because most of the papers I'm talking about are RCTs, uh, but there's also a bunch of other studies, okay? Mm -hmm. And so one of the most high profile sets of studies were done by economists at the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, and this was an RCT of the impact of one laptop per child. Okay, so it was called the EXO laptops. So, so this was done in Peru. And they had one study looking at the impact of providing this at school, another one at the impacts of providing this at home. Okay, so this is really the textbook intervention for the technology evangelists. Okay, so the people who were pushing one laptop per child, you know, were literally evangelizing. Okay, at this point, it was just an act of faith that any, you know, any Anybody who doesn't get on the program is kind of a Luddite and is going to be left behind by technology, okay? So, but what they find is that they find positive impacts on knowledge of computer use, but they find no impact whatsoever on any meaningful measure of cognitive development or academic achievement, okay? So, the computer by itself really didn't do that much in terms of learning outcomes. And then you've got evidence of negative effects, okay? So, uh, this is um, a, a, another well-known study of a high-profile program. Um, this is published in the QJE. Um, and this is Malamud and Pop Alakis. 
who are doing a regression discontinuity-based study of providing home computers to middle schoolers in Romania. Okay, so again, uh, it improved computer. Sorry, that should be scores and not schools. Uh, it improved computer uh, knowledge on on many dimensions, but it actually hurt grades on core school subjects. So test scores in math, English, and Romanian went down by about a quarter to a third of a standard deviation. Okay, um, and what's going on? You know, most students, in fact, report playing computer games on a daily basis, um, and the suggestive evidence of reduced time spent on reading and doing homework. So again, those of you like, you know, who are connected to the internet and have like, you know, me, me included, have 20 browsers open, like, you know, partly on social media, partly on academic stuff, partly reading the news, you know, it's, it's hard to concentrate. Okay. So at the same time, it's also a very effective tool in gathering information. So you can kind of see ex post, this is not that surprising, right? That the technology gives you the potential to do better, but the extent to which that potential translates into real outcomes requires a lot more attention to the details of the design, okay, of what is the binding constraint and is the technology alleviating that binding constraint, okay? Um, so there was a handbook chapter that reviewed uh, the evidence in EdTech and the summary. So this is actually more focused on high income settings. Uh, uh, for low income settings, there's a JPAL review um, that's, uh, you know, I think 2019. Uh, but the overall message is exactly the same, right, which is that there's mixed evidence with a pattern of null effects. Okay, so most of these interventions, for the most part, don't seem to find much effect. Okay, so even though there's so much promise of EdTech that the evidence is all over the place. And so, mm, you know, so the paper I'm going to talk about um, is, you know, a study we did that find, found massive positive effects, okay? And so again, you know, I guess for good or for bad, people get more excited by success than failure. So, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, looking at the study as an example of what's possible, which is good. But I think it's equally important to pay attention to all of the studies that haven't worked, okay? So that we're constantly aware of the pitfalls and constantly testing and not assuming that things are going to work just because they look good on paper, okay? So that was, again, why I spent so much time on that MP study, right? Sometimes it's easy to look at this ex post and saying, oh, it wouldn't have worked. No, but if you go back and look at our grant proposal in 2014, you'll see how excited we were because everything looks so beautiful. OK, but that's why you need the evaluation uh, to tell you if things are working or not. OK, so. So what we're studying in this paper uh, is this technology called MindSpark. So Esther briefly talked about this, but then I think she said I would cover it in more detail. So I'm going to do that. Uh, mm, and so it's developed by this company called Education Initiatives. And, you know, they have actually been in education for a long time. They're the ones who, in fact, designed the assessments for my performance pay paper, right? Doing the mechanical and conceptual testing. Okay, so what's interesting about EI is many people are technologists who come to education. They were educators who came to technology. So their original flagship product really was diagnostic assessment. So they used to do assessments and they were deep believers in this idea of not assessment of learning, which is to classify how you are, but assessment for learning, okay? Okay, which is how do you take the data from the assessment of how the student is doing and use that to analyze the patterns of their errors and then come back with an instructional pathway okay um that will respond to that reason for error okay so i'm not going to have the time to do this but in the paper you'll see in the appendix there's a description of how you know, they will take a, a in a they'll take a battery of questions, okay, and and give it to kids. And based on the patterns of wrong answers of what kind of questions you're getting right and wrong, that will analyze and classify you into different buckets of potential misconceptions. And then they will kind of give you tailored content, not just based on you got this question wrong, but based on the patterns of answers you got right and wrong. The system is able to generate intelligence of what and classify you, right? I mean, of what's the nature of the error. Okay, so. Mm, and that then allows you to provide individual dynamically updated assessment and content. Um, and the key mm, that we're going to see is that the instruction is targeted at the child's actual level of achievement and is not at the level of the curriculum mandated level. OK, uh, the software is platform agnostic. It can be deployed in smartphones and laptops and tablets. Um, mm, on desktops, um, and it's also been deployed in schools in an internet-based model and an after-school model. Okay, so as with a lot of innovations, this product was developed for fee-paying private schools because it's expensive. Mm. And the paying end of the market, you know, you got to pay for the development costs, right? You got to do all of that. So it was essentially the product was doing really well in the high income segment. Um, and then they got philanthropic funding to help set up these after school MindSpark centers, okay, to essentially uh, provide access to low income communities. And and as most philanthropists do, right, they kind of said that this shouldn't be free, you should charge a modest, uh, subsidized but modest fee, okay? So the unsubsidized fee may have been about a thousand rupees per kid, the subsidized fee was about 200 rupees um, per month, um, but that was what was um, required. So what we did in the study is very, very simple. We just randomly selected a bunch of kids and we covered that fee, okay? So we made this completely free. Um, 
And so the intervention itself is this MindSpark after school center, um, which is a 90 minute session and six days a week. Okay, so it is pretty intense. And the, the way the session is structured is that there's 45 minutes of individual study using the Cal and 45 minutes of small group teaching. And what was happening in that group was more kind of when parents were sending their kids to what they thought was a tuition center, they wanted the kids to come back with their homework done. Okay, um, and so because the computer time was scarce, they ended up using the computer time for 45 minutes and then they would bring in a new batch of kids to use the computer and then they would take the first batch to this kind of small supervised study area where you would have this assistant walking around but mainly helping kids with their own homework okay um it's only 619 kids, but because it's individual level randomization, that gives you more than adequate power, okay? So a lot of the early, early childhood studies like Perry Preschool and others were done with samples of 100 kids or 200 kids. So when you're randomizing at the individual level, um, 619 ends up being perfectly adequate. And like I said, the treated students got a fee waiver to attend these MindSpark centers, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so the summary of the results, um, and you know, you know what, in the interest of time, let me just jump straight into the results, okay? Um, so, so I personally think that even more than the RCT results, okay, this is figure one in that paper. Mm. And I actually think this is the most interesting thing to me, even more than the treatment effects, okay? Um, and what this is showing you, if you focus on the left on the math graph, is that the whole intervention was done in middle schools in Delhi. Um, so the, the x-axis is the grade that the student is enrolled in. The y-axis is the assessed level of ability in this initial diagnostic test, okay? So what the system does is it gives you an initial diagnostic test to peg your level of learning and then gives you content at your level, okay? Um, and, and, and what this is doing is it's showing you that if the kids were at grade appropriate standard, they would be on this 45 degree line, okay? In practice, almost all of the kids are dramatically below grade appropriate standards, okay? Um, and that the average level of learning is about half, okay? And the rate of progress is about half, okay? So remember, this is sixth grade. So almost all of the, this is not surprising if you look at the Pratham and Asar type data, because we've got tons of evidence that suggests that close to half the kids in at the end of grade five are not reading at a second grade level, okay? So now this sample is in fact a more advantageous sample because it's urban Delhi and it's also the sample who were motivated enough to sign up and register for the program, okay? So if anything, this is going to be an upper part of the overall distribution, but even that distribution is substantially below standards, okay? So in, in grade six, you're already two, two and a half grade levels behind. By the time you get to grade nine, you're almost four and a half grade levels behind, okay? And um, then, and that's kind of why, right? Like, you know, you get this huge dropout also that happens in the transition to secondary school, okay? Now, but from a measurement perspective, what's especially exciting about this is the fact that the computer-aided software allows us to dynamically, you know, assess. So, Normally in a paper and pencil test, if you're an eighth grade student and I give you an eighth grade test, if you get a zero, I have no idea how far below eighth grade level standards you are, okay? But here, you can kind of start with eight grade questions. If you don't get it, I go down to seven. If you don't get it, I go down to six, go down to five. Um, and so this is exactly like the SAT or GRE would do in any kind of item bank uh, with an item response theory kind of database. Um, you're able to dynamically adjust till you get where the kids are. And so what that allows us to do is basically characterize not just the mean, but characterize the distribution, okay? Uh, mm and to me, this is really among the most insightful pieces of what we get here, which is every dot here is a kid, okay? And so what this is telling you is that in a typical eighth or ninth grade classroom, there are kids at the second grade level, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So like it's almost humanly impossible for a teacher to handle that kind of variation, okay? And so this takes us back to what Esther was talking about, about the tyranny of the curriculum, because what is, so, you know, we talked in the previous lecture, we talked mainly about governance, absenteeism, effort, okay? Now let's flip this around and think about the highly motivated teacher, okay? So you're a motivated teacher, you come to school every day, you really want to get your kids learning, okay? What do you do? You basically take the textbook, okay? And you complete the syllabus because you define you're being a good teacher by having lesson plans based on the textbook that you have come and transacted in the classroom. And you know, you may even do some review sessions, but essentially your job, the way you perceive your job is to teach the syllabus, okay? Because that's the textbook and that's what you're expected to do, okay? But if you're sitting and with a classroom with kids at second or third or fourth grade level, what are you gonna do, okay? And so it's almost humanly impossible to handle that kind of variation. And, but what the system does, which I'll show you, is it's able to measure where you are and give you content at exactly your level. Okay, um, and the effects we find is just stunning. Um, and Esther showed you this, right? There's almost like a doubling in kind of uh, test score gains in math, and almost this is mm, 
get these different times again, but once you adjust for this, it's not 4x, it's more like 2.5x, okay? Uh, but there's a subtle measurement point here, which is we're able to do this because these are item response theory linked models, which allow us to characterize the absolute rate of progress in the control schools, okay? So what this tells you is between the baseline and the end line, the control schools, you know, the gain, let's now do this in regression format. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the control schools gain about 0.36 standard deviations on the IRT scale, and the treatments basically double that in that. In Hindi, it's about 0.15, and it goes up by almost you know 2.5x. Okay, so these are huge increases, um, given that the entire intervention was only about four months. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in fact, when we first did this project, uh, this was meant to be a pilot that would then lead to a larger RCT, okay? But in the end, uh, we, the, this pilot became the main paper, mainly because the effects were already so big that you know it just became important to get it out there. Uh, but also, as Esther mentioned, it turns out that the centers actually shut down. So we couldn't continue the experiment, and I'll come back to that at the end, okay? But bottom line is, it was hugely effective. Uh, and then this is looking at heterogeneity. You see that these effects are seen at every part of the distribution, okay? So you're organizing kids by baseline percentile. This is the weakest, this is the strongest in the baseline test. And you see that for every child, regardless of what level you start at, you're now doing significantly better. And you can't rule out that there's any difference here, okay? So remember in yesterday's paper, this uh, was showing you um, some increase in variance. I mean, here, no, well, that's not true. This is exactly the same because for the baseline one, it was similar, but the, but, the, but the point here is that consistent with the technology being able to customize the instruction, you see similar gains for all kids, okay? But here is the other interesting part. If you now look at this, at different parts of the distribution, okay, and break it down relative to the improvement happening in the control group, okay? So because what this is showing you is, it's just showing you in, uh, in, in, in regression terms with a smooth, uh, uh, with, with a smooth plot, kernel plot. Uh, but now we're doing this at the level of terciles. And the most important thing here is that if you look at the blues, the blues are telling you how much progress is happening in the control school. OK, so this is the business as usual gain that's happening. Mm. And the reds is the red minus blue is the treatment effect. OK, so this gap is constant at every tercile, which is consistent with the fact that you see similar absolute gains. OK, but in relative terms, this is a much bigger deal for the weakest kids. And that's because the weakest kids are not learning anything in a business as usual setting. And which, again, is not that surprising if you go back to this picture, right, because the weakest kids are so far behind that the regular instruction is really not translating into much learning at all. OK. Mm. And so in relative terms, this was uh, a big, a much bigger deal for the weaker kids, okay? And then this is the point about, mm, from a research perspective, what's so exciting about this kind of Cal is we have access to literally millions of data points, right? So this is just a snapshot of a single day. And what you see is what the system is doing. So this is now flipping that picture and putting the grade on the exact, grade assessed to the x-axis, okay? So what this is telling you is if you're in eighth grade, classroom. Remember, there was kids assessed at a two, at a three, at a four, at a five, at a six. And this is now the grade level difficulty of the question assigned. So it means that if you're in eighth grade, but assessed at a second grade level, the MindSpark system is giving you questions at a second grade level. Mm -hmm. If you're assessed at a third grade level, it's giving you mainly at the third. Some kids are being stretched. Some kids are being reinforced, okay? But it's in the two to four band as opposed to eight, okay? So that's kind of the band you're seeing. And this is the customization that is possible that no individual teacher could humanly handle that kind of variation, okay? So, and um, consistent with that, you see that students in all grades, right, mean learn, and um, we see almost a full year level of progress within about four months, okay, which, um, which really is quite, uh, quite uh, promising, okay. Um, so this is, again, the typical ninth grade kid in math starts out at a level that's below grade five, at the end of a year has kind of reached about 5.75, okay, in, in about four months. Mm. And so if you think about this, not just in terms of productivity per dollar spent, but productivity per unit of time, uh, this ends up, to, just for some perspective, right, the IV estimates from this study are about as big as in four, five months as we got from five years in the teacher performance pay study, okay? Um, and so, and that was 0.55 standard deviations in math, which are among the biggest treatment effects we've seen in kind of, uh, in, in, in developing country education. And here you got a similar amount of gain in five months, okay, as opposed to five years. Now, of course, there'll be decay and persistence and the effects may not last, but, you know, just to give you a sense of how much more was possible when you were able to customize instruction. Mm. Now, but here comes a tricky part, a tricky part that's really important both for research and also for parents, okay? Mm. 
is in assessing the value of this program is because of this, of this picture, what happens is most of the content you're getting is in fact at below grade level in math, okay? Now in Hindi, <laughs> It turns out that the you get a lot more grade level content, and that's because in language you don't have nearly as much lexicographic ordering. Okay, so um, you can get more complex sentences and stuff, but language is still language. Okay, so it's a lot more subjective as to what the grade standard is. Whereas in math, if you don't know the basics, the next level makes no sense. Okay, so the grade level kind of mapping makes more sense for math. Um, but what you see here is that what the MindSpark system is doing in math is if you're an eighth grade kid, you're almost never getting an eighth grade question, okay? So most of the content you're getting is kind of somewhere between grade three and six because that's where most of the kids are, okay? And whereas in Hindi, you're getting, if you're in grade six, you're getting a lot more grade six questions. If you're in grade eight, you're getting a lot more seven and eight. If you're nine, you're getting a lot, you know. So there's a lot more questions that are closer to the official grade level. And the, the results we get are completely consistent with this because our test uh, has to, we need test questions at all levels of difficulty to capture the distribution. Mm. And if you break down the results on our test based on questions at or above grade level versus questions that are below grade level, you see that in the math test, if I tested the kids on grade level questions, you would conclude that the program had no effect, okay? Um, and that's not because the program had no effect. It's because all the instruction was happening below grade level. And when you look at the questions below grade level, you see a huge positive effect. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Hindi, it kind of shows up both above and, you know, at and above grade level as well as below grade level. And this is on our test, okay? So what we did is we also went and collected the data from the official school tests of these kids. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really quite consistent regardless of what source of data you look at, okay? So again, if you were to assess the program based on the school test, okay, uh, you would think that there was no effect at all except in Hindi, right, where I've already shown you that the content that was being given was grade appropriate content, okay, so if you aggregate across all the subjects, it would seem that, you know, there was really no impact of this program. So the deeper message here is for research, okay, when you're doing research in developing countries, um, you need to pay an enormous amount of attention to measurements. Isaac talked about this briefly, but Essentially, if you are measuring at a different part of the distribution than where the intervention is, you can conclude, um, you know, things that are completely erroneous. Uh, relative. So if we had just, suppose we'd not done our own test, suppose we had just gone and used school level data, um, in, for the most part, we would have said this is not that effective. Suppose we designed our own test and had just designed a great appropriate test, we would say that it had no effect on that, when we know it in fact had a massive effect because the program was giving you instruction below the grade level, okay? so. Um, yeah, so where we are like now in terms of the MindSpark journey is that the daily results are promising, okay, but they're still best considered a proof of concept, okay, so mm, it's a proof of concept that large gains are possible in rapid time frames with a combination of the benefits of computer aided learning and teaching at the right level, okay, so um, it really is kind of teaching at the right level, but kind of taken to the next level because teaching at the right level is still done at a group level, right, where you have a volunteer who's kind of saying, instead of taking all the kids based on their grades, let me organize them by the the level of their initial by their initial levels and mm, do instruction but you're still confined to like a group of say 15 okay now when you get a middle school that becomes much harder both because the variation is higher okay so grouping kids is harder and also the micro details start getting such that kids need different things okay so the concept of TARL is very very powerful but it's maybe much more difficult to implement with a human uh, mm, kind of additional volunteer or teacher in middle school, um, but the CAL allows you to do that as we've shown you in, in that graph, okay? So the question is, of course, can we replicate these results in government schools, okay? So in Delhi, uh, education initiatives ran all the logistics, the after-school centers. It's also a self-selected sample of interest students, okay? So we recruited in the public schools and only about 10% showed up. And, mm, and also the other important thing from a productivity perspective is remember that we are supplementing as opposed to substituting, okay? So the intervention does give you 90 extra minutes per day. Now, we do have a lot of evidence to suggest that this is driven by the technology. That's because there was a parallel RCT done on private tutoring by Jim Berry and Priya Mukherjee, uh, literally in the same time and also in Delhi, okay? So in that sense, we got very lucky because that allowed us to kind of make the comparison and saying that, listen, here's an intervention that gave you the person and that gave you the time and they find zero effect, okay? Um, whereas we've got the person, the time and the technology suggesting that the technology was really kind of a key part, okay? Now, of course, mm, the time still matters, right? But the technology is improving the productivity of that time, okay? So what we're now doing, we're close to completing a three-year follow-up study um, that reached over 5,000 students in 
actually over 10,000 once you add all, all the cohorts, okay, um, in 40 schools in the state of Rajasthan, but it's an in-school model, okay, where what we've done is essentially um, we've kind of helped these schools, we, you know, raise the money for this and build MindSpark labs, and the a lot of work goes in and in, Again, Esther discussed this briefly when they talk about their different models of teaching at the right level, right? So they had their original paper and then spent a decade thinking about different ways of taking this model and putting it in schools to do this at scale. And we're kind of on a very similar journey, okay? Which is once you want to integrate this in schools, a lot of the work involves the timetable, okay? So mm, what, what subjects are you going to do less of? And it turns out you cannot, okay? Because you want to fit this in the same school time because this is not supplemental. So what we ended up doing was if in the week you have six math periods, okay, that you would have two MindSpark periods a week when your class would rotate into the MindSpark lab. So the lab would then be getting used all the time, okay, by different grades and different subjects, but students would kind of have two MindSpark periods in, in a week, okay? Now, you can see already this is going to be really, really challenging, okay? Because while it's good in those two periods, that the kids are getting more customized instruction, it's also much harder for the regular teacher to now say, instead of six periods, I have only four, okay? So how am I going to cover my grade appropriate content? And this is this constant tension between the push to complete the syllabus and the exam versus kind of doing effective instruction based on where the kids are, okay? And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. Um, Okay, but the bottom line is, you know, the we would have had the results earlier, but for COVID, but fortunately, we completed our end line, um, but we couldn't get data entry done for about a year, but we should have this paper done by this uh, coming end of this summer break, okay? Now, so I'm not going to show you results from that, but I'm just going to show you again this picture. Um, and this is now uh, not just middle school, but all the way from grade one to grade eight, okay? Because we're doing this in these integrated schools that go all the way from grade one to grade eight. And and what you see is that same pattern holds up, okay? Except that each dot is now 10 kids and not one kid. And But you see this all the way from grade one to grade eight, okay? Um, and so I really consider this perhaps the most important picture in developing country education, okay? Because um, it helps us make sense of why so many of our input-based interventions are not translating into outcomes, okay? So um, Michael Kramer has this paper in Kenya, right? Giving free textbooks had no impact. It benefited the top 20% of the kids who could read, but the average kid in that sample couldn't read, okay? So that input didn't translate. But again, a lot of the kind of well-intentioned um, but ineffective programs in education come from the fact that programs are designed by elites who kind of think about their own constraints, right? So it's almost inconceivable to most of us that having a book is not a good thing, right? But most people wouldn't even think of the possibility that, hey, giving the book would have no effect on the kids can't even read, okay? And that's what we found there. Um, and again, what you see is that the average eighth grade kid is in a fourth grade level, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if you're giving them content, remember, you know, it's not like everybody's below grade standard. It's just that this is a public school sample, okay? So there's a lot of kids in private schools, right? I mean, who are doing much, much better, but this is this public school sample. Mm -hmm. And so the other important thing from this picture is, you know, when I present this picture, uh, people as, as kind of a picture of India, people in the US will often get very puzzled and they'll say, you know, you know, we thought you had a fantastic education system in India, right? You, the CEO of Microsoft, the CEO of Google, the CEO of IBM, right? I mean, every, you know, the uh, top tech company seems to be getting headed by somebody of Indian origin. So clearly you must be doing something right in your education system, okay? Now, the answer to that is that What's, what that's really picking up is that what you have is not a high quality education system. What you have is a high quality filtration system, okay? Because your entire system is set up around exams and exams and exams to identify who is smart, okay? So what you have is essentially a selection paradigm of education that you have, and, and what you're picking up in the US is if, you, if you're taking the top 1% or the top 0.1% of a billion person distribution, okay? Um, those kids are gonna do great things, okay? Regardless of what the education system is doing, okay? So it's not that the education system is not working, but it's really based on identifying who is smart as opposed to teaching people, okay? And so, so the fundamental paradigm shift that we need for kind of developing country education systems is to move from a selection paradigm to a human development paradigm, okay? That says, regardless of where you are, are you better tomorrow than where you were yesterday, okay? So can we get a culture of continuous systematic progress for kids at every part of the distribution, okay? And this connects with what Esther was calling the tyranny of the curriculum, right? Because it's exactly... Mm, 
that tyranny, right, that says we need to set high standards, okay, so that the, uh, the kids who come through, like, you know, can compete with the world's best, okay, so you've got this push for high standards, but what that high standards is doing is really building more filtration. Now, don't get me wrong, okay, it's not that we don't need sorting and identifying who's, who's, mm, has the most academic ability, okay, because there's, in every society that there are limited spots in higher education, there are limited spots in, um, mm, you know, positions of leadership. Um, and so to the extent that positions of, say, science, technology, innovation, leadership, that these are positions that affect the common good, okay, that affect other people's welfare, you could write down a Rawlsian social utility function that would accept a certain amount of inequality and say that it's in fact optimal to identify who is kind of the most talented and put them into these positions of leadership because that affects the common good, okay? So this is not to say that we shouldn't have some sorting and selection to identify who's kind of high, high capability because every society does that, okay? The problem is not that. The problem is that we give up on anybody who's not at that threshold. Okay, so is that if you're not able to pass the exams, then the system basically gives up on you. Okay, so and that's kind of what you're seeing over here is that mm, essentially those kids at the bottom tercile who are not learning anything in school, it's because from the perspective of the system, if you're not able to keep with the program, effectively they've forgotten you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that is the monumental waste. It's not that we do the screening and sorting at the high end, it's that we don't do any human capital formation um, or at least anything close to potential, okay, for the kids who are not making those standards. Um, and this also then explains other pathologies of the Indian education system, which is why do you have so many kind of unemployable graduates, okay, or people who have all of these credentials, but you put them in a job setting they're almost useless. And that's because the entire education system is structured on cramming your way to these exams, right? Because if you're not at the grade level, you're clearly not going to understand deep concepts. So, but you also don't want to give up and partly because there's also compulsory schooling. So you're kept in school. So what's your next best option? The next best option for most kids is to basically cram every past exam over the past like eight or 10 years. And then you hope that some subset of those past questions or some familiar pattern will show up on your test. Okay. So you're just hoping that somehow you will pass that test based on cramming um, these past tests. And then if I put you in a new situation where you need to actually figure out things, you're basically, uh, you know, almost useless because the education system has not given you uh, the adequate skills required to deal um, with that, okay? So, so this is again a case where, you know, and this is true in development research more generally, right? When you come at things from a program evaluation perspective, it's often tempting to kind of say, hey, like, you know, here's the program, did it work, okay? But, but in a way, at a deeper level, what we care about is generating generalizable insights that gives us understanding about how a system functions, okay? So it's not just about the treatment effect, but the extent to which the program design and the treatment effect help you illustrate what the underlying conditions of the, of the situation you're trying to study are, okay? So for example, I have this recent paper on public employment programs. So it is at some level, the paper is about an, a treatment of, <clears throat> of a public employment program, but the nature of the treatment effect also tells us something about the underlying structure of the labor markets. Okay, so similarly here, you know, the paper is fundamentally about the, the RCT and the program effect, but looking at this heterogeneity and looking at where the gains are then tells you so much more about opening up the black box of the Indian education system. And so, which is why to me, again, I get as much or more excited with the potential of technology for measurement and helping us really, really understand what's going on. Okay. So uh, how am I on time? Okay. So I will, yeah, like yesterday, go to 8.30. So, you know, there's a tons of other active research. And again, uh, this is, I don't mean to just talk about my papers, but that was the mandate from the course designers saying that often you can teach these things much better by going into depth in, into your own papers, because you know, these inside details so well, but there's a ton of good work on this. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm giving you five papers just in 2021 um, that, you know, that caught my attention and I want to bring to your attention for different reasons. Okay, so mm, now uh, there's two papers uh, which are both very interesting because they were done at scale. Okay, so there's a paper by uh, Nicola Bianchi and co-authors uh, looking at studies in, in China uh, that looking at the impact of connecting top teachers in China to rural students through broadband internet. Okay, so this is in the context of school education. But again, remember what... Mm, 
we talked about in the context of absence is that the way we've traditionally tried to bring quality to low income and kind of uh, rural underserved populations is to get a highly qualified teacher and move that person there. Okay, but that is kind of very, very inefficient. It's a bad use of that teacher's time, because if this is such a good teacher, you want to expose that teacher to as many kids as possible. And it's also the teacher doesn't want to be there. Okay, so even if you post them, you're going to have other challenges. Okay, so this way they're getting top teachers, but they're connecting them through the broadband to rural students. Mm. And they find very strong positive impacts uh, over time on both academic achievement and labor market outcomes. And they find these effects like seven to 10 years after the program, okay, suggesting long term impacts. Uh, and then similarly, there's this other paper by Laya Navarro Sola, um, and she's studying um, the impact of expanding junior secondary education in Mexico using what was called the Telesecundaria, which is schools using televised lessons, okay, because again, the problem of getting high quality education to remote underserved areas is the hardest thing is just getting the qualified teacher out there, okay, so this was not broadband internet, but using televised lessons, and, you know, the paper is less about the ed tech and more about returns to education, because she also then has a bunch of downstream labor market data, but the important point is that the first stage that made that paper possible is the technology based education, okay, so again, um, and tech doesn't just have to be like, you know, fancy smart boards and stuff like that. It, it really can just be, and there's also older studies of radio, okay? It doesn't need to be very expensive, but that radio instruction RCTs found was highly effective in the 80s and 90s. And this is now about TV, it's about internet, but it is about delivering high quality content at scale to people in communities who otherwise wouldn't have had access, okay? So both of those studies are quite promising. Um, and then coming to kind of doing more micro variations with experiments, right? Because neither of those two are in, uh, RCTs. Those are both natural experiments, right? So you don't randomize at that kind of scale. Um, but now coming back to RCTs, um, there's this nice paper forthcoming in the AJ policy uh, that, again, it looked at expert-led curriculum-based videos, okay? And this was content that was made available to schools and teachers. But what they did was they tested two different models, okay? In one, it was done through the teacher, right? And in the other, it was given straight to the students. Um, and what they found was that the version that went through the teacher significantly raised test scores, but the one that went straight to the student actually hurt test scores, okay? Um, and, and in fact, even the China model, um, and these other models, they have a human being there, right? It's not like you're putting the kids in a class and having them listen to an expert in Beijing like 2,000 miles away, okay? There is a human being, there is a teacher, um, mm, and there's a teacher who's still kind of, you know, monitoring time use and making sure there's adherence and making sure that there's questions being answered. It's just that the high quality content is coming from the technology, okay? So, and so again, the, the really important implication of this of this Pakistan study is that we really shouldn't be thinking about technology as a substitute for for teachers, but we should be thinking about technology as enhancing the productivity of teachers okay and that the human interaction is still going to be critical and there's another paper i'll talk about. Mm -hmm that makes that even more strongly okay uh, then there's another paper that was just published in the journal of um, the Development economics. So it's a very simple paper, okay, but I like it. Uh, there's a few things I really like about it, okay. So it's a paper that's looking at boarding schools and giving kids access to um, computers with Wikipedia, okay. So the first thing that they're doing here in the design that reflects prior experience is that the computer use is restricted to certain websites, okay? So you simply cannot navigate to any, any website. So it's highly restricted in terms of what you can use the computer for. And most of what you can use it is Wikipedia. But the other thing I really like about this paper is in measurement. So one nagging doubt I have always had about these zero results from say like one laptop per child, okay? Is that are we measuring the wrong things? Are we measuring in the sense that is perhaps the entire point of ed tech is not to make you know the facts of basic math and language better, but perhaps the whole point of ed tech is to say that if you need information, you know where to look for it, okay? So, and so in that way, testing you on the stock of knowledge is not the right thing, but that what I really should be doing is giving you an open book exam and asking you to go find new information, okay? And, and so that's exactly what this paper does. And so that's why I like it, you know, even though the intervention is quite simple, I like what it did with measurement, which is kind of have this kind of unstructured open book kind of go find information. And then the kids who have been exposed to the treatment did much better, okay? Um, mm, and so that's that study. And then there's um, an even more recent un unpublished um, paper, which, uh, um, you know, which, which we know because uh, this was a project that was funded, like, you know, through the JPAL kind of initiatives. Um, but it gives you a sense of how the frontier is really, really moving to the cutting edge. Okay, so uh, this is an AI based intervention that's actually giving feedback to students on their writing. Okay, so mm, 
It's not just kind of, here's my question bank and I'm giving you multiple choice. I'm giving you questions to fill. I'm using your data to then kind of fine tune what content I'm giving you, okay? So this is now like moving from uh, AI playing chess to AI playing Go, okay? Which is actually giving feedback to students on writing from natural language processing and looking at, you know, how student essays are being constructed. Um, and this was an AI-based intervention that provided feedback. Now, they had another intervention that also had a human grader, okay, to see, like, are there things that the human grader would pick up that the AI was not, okay? Um, so there's good news, bad news on that. So the bad news is that the human actually added very little value to the grading process, okay? So there was not much difference there. But the good news is that when they look at what the teachers were doing in these schools, they find that there's a reallocation of teacher time towards things that require... Mm, a little bit more contextual and individualized attention to students because the grading work was being taken over by the software, okay? And so there's a deeper point here, which is if you go back to this classic Otter Levy Murnain QJE paper in 2004, which is then studying what is the impact of technology on the structure of employment and labor markets, um, their main kind of conclusion is that tasks that can be routinized that you can write down in an algorithm are things that will be taken over by technology, but things that require more contextual awareness are things that the human interaction is still going to be really important. Okay, so the original view here was teaching is very much in that sphere. Mm -hmm. The good news is that technology shows that the technology can come in and take out a lot of the routinized function, but the full potential will now come from re-optimizing teacher tasks towards the things that the computer cannot do, okay? So it could be the non-cognitive, it could be the social skills, it could be the grit, it could be other things, because the more and more routinized aspect of the instruction could be done by the computer, okay? So bottom line is the, this huge interest in technology, lots of interesting research, but you really have to pay attention to the details of how you're alleviating binding constraints, okay? So let me then take, uh, like yesterday, my last three slides, uh, to talk about another paper, which is now technology in governance, okay? Mm -hmm. And so this is, again, a paper I like a lot. Uh, it's by Abhijit Singh. And what this is, it's a very, very simple paper. And it connects to that first paper because it was done in the same setting of Madhya Pradesh, okay? Um, and this was a project that... Mm, when Abhijit was in the field, like, you know, and he's done a bunch of work on measurement, it just occurred to him that uh, it gave it gave us an opportunity to go and audit the quality of government data in terms of learning outcomes. Okay, so what this picture is showing is that the government of Madhya Pradesh has a flagship student assessment program called Pratibha Parv, that's the PP, um, where they take assessment seriously, right? So they really took I, seriously this idea that I need to know how kids are doing so that we can improve their learning and focus the whole system on learning outcomes, okay? So they put an enormous amount of effort every year, right? Teachers, uh, the, the state government designs these standardized assessment papers that are then implemented in the schools and student level data is recorded. And in fact, the national government's Niti Aayog, um, which is kind of India's apex policy think tank, when they put out a book of best practices across states, this was called a best practice in, in learning assessment, okay? So this is already like on the right tail of the distribution of what governments are doing. Now, what Abhijit did was kind of really simple exposed, but all he did was these tests were done um, in the official test was done in January. Okay. And we just went back like a month later with the enumerators and randomly retested a bunch of these kids on exactly the same questions. Okay. That they'd been tested in, in the January official test. Okay. Um, mm, and so now, if anything, the test score should improve, right? Because you've had a little bit more time to learn. And so again, the x-axis is what is the proportion correct on the official test. Um, if this is correct, you should be on this 45 degree line, okay? In practice, kids are doing about half of that right, um, suggesting that there's just severe inflation in the scores, okay, in the official data. Mm -hmm. And so again, and this inflation is not random, you see much more inflation at the bottom end of the distribution, okay? So if you now look at this, this was done at the question level, the previous slide. If you now do this at the student level, mm, what you see is that uh, in the official data, so the other very, very interesting insight in that paper, which is consistent with these systems, education systems being fundamentally about sorting and filtration and not about human capital, is that even though the data was fudged, okay, Nobody fudged the ranking of the kids, okay? So the ranking is completely unfudged. It's just that the kids who are kind of scoring 20 or 30% are basically shown as being above 60%, okay? So essentially, this is why... Mm, 
speaking to the larger discourse on education policy in India in the past 15 years, you know, we've wasted an enormous amount of time arguing about the data because um, Pratham, which does an independent assessment, year after year would come and tell you that learning levels are really bad. Um, the government would be using what's called the NAS data, which is the National Assessment Survey, which is done of, through official channels. And yes, th there's a lot of attention goes into the design. It, like the senior people put an enormous amount of effort. Okay, so they're understandably, again, defensive about it. But on the field, what we've seen in kind of our field-based audits is cheating is just rampant. And you see this in multiple dimensions, right? We Sometimes it's not even the teacher, it's just kids copying from each other, okay? So that'll give you the same effect because I can't score higher than the best performing kid in the class because I'm copying, right? Um, but there's a combination of copying, there's a combination of kind of, uh, you know, sometimes teachers writing the answers on the board, um, and then there's combination, and sometimes, you know, just at the, at the grading stage, even though the answer paper is wrong, mm -hmm you'll just inflate it, okay? And again, the qualitative interviews with the teachers will tell you that they'll say, oh, if we show that the child is is uh, has a failing grade of a D or F, then we will have to do all of these remedial supplemental instructions and we don't have the time for that because we have to complete our portion and the textbook, okay? Um, so it's not even that the teacher is a complete slacker. The teacher is just being kind of rational because the core job of this teacher is being defined as you have to complete the textbook. Now, you're adding this other expectation of saying, I also want you to do supplemental remedial instruction and the teacher does just does, does doesn't have the time okay and so the way they're responding to the pressure of focusing on foundational literacy and numeracy is they're basically just faking the data okay at the lower end of the distribution so that they can continue teaching the text okay mm. And so that highlights, again, the importance of, you know, the approach I was talking about yesterday about using the contract teacher model to create apprenticeship based training programs so that you're then able to support this regular teacher with additional kind of apprentice teaching resources. Uh, because again, if you look at how are you going to handle this distribution, right? I mean, that fundamental problem that we have. Uh, so when Esther talks about how much resistance there is to changing the curriculum to make the levels easier, it's because remember, the curricular conversations are being driven by the elites, right? I mean, who kind of all have aspirations for their kids to get into these kind of highly competitive engineering colleges, you know, make it big in the IT sector. So if you say that I'm going to simplify the curricular standards, you're going to get massive pushback from the elites, okay, I'm saying we don't want to dumb down the curricula. But at the same time, if you keep your standards high over here, you're going to get these 60% of kids, right, I mean, who are not at the most basic levels. And then you're putting the teacher in an impossible situation of saying that I need you to both cater to the top and cater to the bottom. And as you go to higher and higher grades, with no detention and kind of social promotion, that variation gets bigger and bigger, okay? So at some level, this you cannot just address this problem by saying, I want you to do everything and I'm not going to give you more resources, okay? So um, you need, but, you, but the important thing is you can't just blindly throw resources, right? You need to use the research to then say, what is the smart places where I put the resources at? So, you know, if based on everything we know, if tomorrow I was advising an education minister and kind of asked what to do, you know, the two or three big things I would do would be that apprenticeship based model that gives the regular teacher the instructional support to then do the small group instruction and support the additional instruction needed for these bottom 40% of the kids or all below 50%. In fact, in math, it's even worse. Okay. In math, nobody scores at even 60% um, and the inflation is even more severe. Okay. This is the reading score. And you see that there's, as per the official data, there's no learning crisis at all, okay? And so this is why, I mean, we wasted 15 years as a country because in the official data, there's complete denial, okay, about this crisis. But every source of independent data shows you how big this problem is, okay? Now, how can technology help with measurement and governance? So what Abhijit then also has is not just documenting a problem. Um, they also then look at a tablet-based assessment system, okay? And the idea here is that if you test with a tablet, it has three or four big advantages, okay? So one is because it's got a custom, it's got a question bank of thousands of questions, I can have different kids getting different test papers, okay? So the copying becomes much harder because you're actually dealing with different questions. Um, the second thing is because the answers are recorded real. So, and again, when the question papers are different, it becomes much harder for a teacher to help you by writing the answer on the board, okay? Um, so that's one thing. Second is because the answers are recorded real time and uploaded to a server, it becomes hard to manipulate the data afterwards, okay? So, mm, so you can see how the technology in principle could substantially improve the quality of kind of assessments and data. And, you know, you see this in the distributions that in the paper test, you see how many more kids are getting 
like everything right in 90%, in the tablets, the distribution is so much below what you get in the paper, okay? Um, and then what the paper does is it looks at different algorithms based on this Angrist paper, statistical algorithms for detecting cheating. Mm. And essentially, um, you know, over 40% of the paper-based tests get flagged for cheating, but less than 5% of the tablet-based tests get flagged for cheating, okay? Um, so again, just bringing the circle back that we talked about education production functions, we talked about inputs, and then mm, the punchline is that inputs by themselves don't seem to do that much. The binding constraint is pedagogy and governance, okay? Now, the researchers identified those as a constraint, but now how do you solve those problems at scale? And that's where the technology comes in. Again, blindly throwing technology is not going to help you, but using the technology to alleviate the binding constraints of pedagogy and governance um, can give you a step function improvement at scale, okay? So my last slide. Mm, to wrap up is technology has enormous potential to improve both pedagogy and governance, but it requires careful attention to what the binding constraints are and to using the technology to alleviate these constraints. Now, the tragedy, that's the good news. The bad news is if you go look at most countries' national education technology policy, the bulk of the focus is on hardware procurement, okay? So what is the budget for computers? And, and of course, the side benefit of that is you can put pictures of politicians and the laptops that are distributed, okay? So I have slides of pictures of, you know, uh, I'm not even being partisan, multiple states. You can take states from the north of India, states from the south of India. They all have their favorite laptop distribution program with a picture of politician on it, okay? Um, and that by itself is unlikely to have much impact, okay? So we've already seen this from... Mm, you know, from uh, from OLPC, and then in a, in this field work in Rajasthan that we were doing with MindSpark, okay. Mm -hmm. So what was very interesting was we were doing these in these model schools that got a budget for a computer lab. And these schools got labs with like six to eight computers, okay? But what's amazing is in our field visits, we would go to many schools and most of the time these labs would be locked, okay? They would be used at most maybe one or two periods a week. And the reason for that is that the head teacher, the biggest concern of the head teacher is that the computer should not get stolen and nothing should break, okay? Because if something is stolen, he's held accountable, but if it's not used, he's not held accountable. OK, so it then just, again, highlights the differences between kind of what we may think about something at a policy level and what the binding constraint is at the field level. And nobody's thinking about the fact that the headmaster's biggest concern, and I can tell you many stories about this, is the trouble he gets into if that computer is stolen. OK, so just focusing on the hardware procurement and the hardware distribution, I can practically guarantee is going to have very little impact, even though that's the bulk of where the governments were spending their time. Mm. Okay, and, um, and in fact, the pandemic, so there is one other thing, uh, elephant in the room, which I haven't talked about, right, which is, I think there's a very real risk here that ed tech has exacerbated inequalities, okay, because um, the, the elites have had access, right, to a variety of technologies, which the poor have not. And I think the reason this is particularly pernicious, like, you know, when I see the discourse in India in particular, right, it is, again, the, the policy discourse is driven by elites who are kind of projecting what is optimal for their kids onto the entire population. OK, so there is a trade off between health and education when you keep schools open. Yes, there's an elevated risk of COVID and that should not be trivialized. OK, but if you're high SES with educated parents and access to technology, then that trade off is much kind of more limited because you're getting a large part of the education at home. So you prefer to keep your kids at home. OK, but if you're low SES with no technology at home and kind of, you know, uh, first gen generation learners with uh, without educated parents, the school is the only thing you have. OK, and also if you're in a rural area that's lower density population, it's more feasible to have outdoor schooling. So, you know, to me, it's a complete scandal uh, that we haven't kind of uh, differentiated in open schools, you know, earlier, but it's a case of where the interests of the elite have kind of dominated the public discourse um, and kept schools closed way longer um, than I think they should have been, okay? Um, and it's almost certain that this has exacerbated inequalities, okay? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes low tech interventions are the best. So, you know, we just completed this other paper of putting an extra worker in preschool education centers in, in rural uh, India. And we found that that had huge effects on both learning outcomes as well as improved child malnutrition. And on the other hand, we've also been trying to use, you know, mm, the setting where this digital divide was so kind of distressing to, to do uh, our own studies of procuring devices and giving them to poor kids. But what we're seeing is that the adherence is actually very, very low, okay? And again, it suggests that even in MindSpark, the, with the MindSpark centers, the role, and this is what uh, the MindSpark CEO would tell us, right? That the teacher there has a very important role, but the role is not in the instruction, the role is more in the adherence and making sure that there's adult supervision and making sure that the kids are actually using the technology the it should, okay? And 
what we're seeing is that simply giving out the tablets at home, at least, and we don't have results yet, but just from the usage data, it's not looking very promising, okay? Um, so I think there's this very real concern of ed tech exacerbating inequalities. Mm. Now, this is not to say we shouldn't have ed tech because the long arc of human progress has always been that innovation has taken place at the high end of the distribution of people who can afford to pay. Okay, So if you look at the Indian ed tech space and the number of unicorns, it looks like the most exciting space. So the good news is let that money come in, let that innovation happen. But then policy and philanthropy and, you know, and global aid agencies then, you know, and researchers, we have our job cut out in terms of them thinking about how do you take that innovation and accelerate the deployment in a way that can benefit, right, mean those who actually need it the most, okay? Uh, so there's tons of areas of active research. Mm -hmm. Improve, including improvement in measurement, sophistication of what the computer does. How do you engage parents? How do you reorient teacher training to kind of better use the technology? How do you understand and increase student engagement? <laughs> and can you do composite interventions that leverage and test complementarities, right? Because when you have content and engagement and incentives and motivation, maybe you can have step function increases in learning outcomes. Uh, and so, yeah, so fortunately there's tons, tons and tons of new and exciting things for you all to do. So let me stop there. Apologies again for the speed, but Hopefully, you know, you can re-listen to these lectures at 0.75 speed. Okay, so I'm done here. Thank you. But I'll take questions. I will take a few questions. We have one quick question. Um, is the scale up MindSpark study available as a working paper? I'm not yet. So we had slides that should be available hopefully by this summer, I want to say, June or July. Another question, uh, what were the main differences in the impacts of the technology and education, for example, between the impact on the secondary school students and the primary school students? Yeah, so if you're asking me about early stage results of the of the Rajasthan MindSpark study, I think, um, again, this is just very preliminary, um, you know, I haven't had time to really pressure test stuff. So I, yeah, so I think basically the gains are broad based, but I think the gains are actually bigger, um, not in grade one, two, three. So it suggests that the kids do need to be somewhat socialized into kind of the process of being able to use the computer and stuff. So I think the gains are slightly bigger in the older grades, but don't hold me to that. Okay, we'll get these results out to you guys by by the summer. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, does the research take into account the children's approach to tests, for example, anxiety to tests, surprise tests? Yeah, so I think, you know, all of these are important and valid concerns about measurement. I think with any RCT, essentially what you want to do is keep the measurement and monitoring identical so that whatever you're measuring is net of that, okay? Now, I think there is evidence to suggest that the amount of stakes placed on the test on the day of the test do matter, okay? And that's why in the complementarities paper with Isaac that I talked about yesterday, I had, you know, I showed you the difference in the test scores, the treatment effects in the low stakes and the high stakes tests, okay? And what you saw there, that there was a systematic about 0.12 to 0.15 standard deviation improvement in performance when the stakes were higher, okay? Um, now, again, that was equally done like across those treatment arms, but in the control group, there's no stake, okay? And so that's why you will get a difference in treatment effect because by construction, I can't put stakes in the controls. So when you do the low stakes test and the high stakes test, you see that additional difference that I think can be attributed to how much test taking effort there is. Um, but you know, the low stakes test is kind of, but it's a little tricky, right? Mm -hmm because you can't just interpret the low stakes test as a measure of knowledge, right? Because remember, like I said, the test performance is a combination of knowledge and effort. So you may have the knowledge. So maybe I need the effort to see what the true difference in knowledge is. So that I think is just another wrinkle <laughs> in interpreting results. And it's like uh, the other big thing which Isaac talked about, right, is the difference between these production function parameters and policy parameters, right? So we also have that in our AJ paper and school grants and household substitution. And so I think there are all of these other slight subtle things that may change in nature of your intervention, which affects the interpretation, but it doesn't affect kind of the policy, the core policy effect of, of what you're estimating. I think unfortunately we're out of time for questions. But no, again, so thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, the, and thanks again to the IGC and Bread and the materials will live online for posterity. So have a great day.